All right, Psalm 82, of course, not very long psalm, but you know that that doesn't mean anything on how long I'm going to preach tonight, right, at this point. Psalm 82, and actually, this, it's, it's really just one main subject that we're dealing with tonight, and I want to focus pretty much the entire sermon just on the subject of gods, like little g gods, and this is also quoted uh, famously in the book of John, and of course, we'll get to that a little bit later and I just, I want to spend a lot of time on this because I think for many people it can be a very confusing passage, especially when Jesus quoted it back to the Pharisees in the book of John. He's quoting this psalm. So I really just want to dig in and make sure that we lay a good foundation and kind of understand what the psalm is talking about, why Jesus references this psalm, so that we could have a real clear understanding of what the Bible is even talking about when he says, oh, is it not written? I've said ye are gods, right? And uh, um, let's just, let's jump right in here. And verse number one, the Bible says, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. Now, one of the things that you'll notice multiple times throughout this psalm in only the eight verses that are here. Uh, at least three times he's talking about judging, how he's the judge, and he judges, uh, and here obviously it says he judges among the gods. Now, we know that there really are no other gods. Like, there is one God, and the Bible is very clear about this as well, that, that there's one God, you know, there's one Lord, there's one God and Father of all, and, and over and over again we see that. And if you turn to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, keep your place here in Psalm 82, put a bookmark it there and, and go back to, uh, go forward, excuse me, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 8. We'll see this expressed because there's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of references to gods in the Bible. And they have to be referenced because people worship false gods all the time and have all throughout history. So you have to be able to talk about this subject of there being gods, even though they don't really, like, really exist. Like, there is no other god but one. But people are setting up gods for themselves. They're putting other things in God's place of the one true God, and they're worshiping what they call God. And whether that be uh, an image, an idol, or whether that be a name, you know, uh, like, like the, the Jehovah's Witnesses worship a God called Jehovah, which God, the God of the Bible is Jehovah. But their God is not the same God as the God of the Bible. Now, they'll tell you that it is, but they've created a different God. They have a different Jesus, right? Because their God is not, does not exist in three persons. They do not believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and that these three are one. They do not believe in that God, but you know what? That's who God is. So if you're going to have a God and you're going to say, no, God does not exist in three persons, then you don't have the God of the Bible, and you've made up your own God. And you could try to claim it's from the Bible, but that would be false. And people do the same thing with Jesus. Oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but Jesus wasn't God in the flesh. Right? He's the Son of God, and that's, you know, the Mormons do that. Jehovah's Witnesses do that. And there's plenty of other people who will have a false God. And 1 Corinthians 8 just covers this uh, pretty succinctly. In verse number 4 there, the Bible reads, As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. Right. So here's the truth of the matter. People build idols and statues and they have all this stuff, but that means nothing. Like inherently, it is just an object. I mean, it's a, a, an idol people that literally will get down and worship that's made out of wood is no different than this wood, is no different than any other wood that comes from a tree or any you know, metal that comes out of the earth. Like it's, it's all just the work of man's hands and literally just has nothing special about it whatsoever. It's just an object. And we know that. We also know that there's none other God but one. There's one God, and that is it, and that's final. There's no other gods. This is true. But then he says in verse 5, For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, right? It's explaining 
There are plenty of things that are called gods in the earth. We know there's one God, and he says, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge, for some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Now, 1 Corinthians 8 is talking a lot about eating things, sacrificed to idols, and kind of dealing with that specific issue, but within the explanation, it definitely lets us know that there are no other gods for real. Like, and the gods that people worship are, you know, devils, right? But they're still not, devils aren't gods, and angels aren't gods, by the way, too. And there's a lot of confusion when it comes to certain passages that might be a little bit difficult to read, but let's, you know, let's do the studying on the passages where people kind of come up with these weird ideas, and they come up with some pretty bizarre stuff, and, you know, and it starts off like, oh, okay, I can see how you might think that, but then they always end up with some pretty serious uh, changes and in, in, in weird interpretations, understanding of Scripture. So, but if we would just let the Bible define itself, let's, let, let's see what it's saying on the surface here. Let's see how it's being used in context, and I think we could get a good understanding of what the passage is talking about. So when the Bible says there back in Psalm 82, that God standeth in congregation of the mighty, he judgeth among the gods. Well, the gods is just going to be these false gods, right? So it's not like God is, is in, uh, around Zeus and, uh, and uh, you know, Mercury and Apollo or whatever. Like, I'm probably mixing Greek and Roman gods, but whatever. Those are fake gods. Those are gods that are made up. They're not real, but... Um, God is the judge. God is the supreme authority, the Bible's even saying, just over everybody. And when the Bible's talking about gods here, and we'll see this, I'm going to prove this to you in just a minute, that this is primarily, I believe, speaking about people who think they're gods or kind of act like they're gods in this, in this earth, right? And these are going to be people of great power or of great stature in, in, within society, these are going to be certain kings and rulers that just wield so much power that it gets to their head and they're puffed up and they just think like they are gods. And they act like they're gods on this earth. So in a way, they are gods, like the lowercase g, but they're not God, right? Clearly. So this is a people who says he judgeth among the gods. And then it says in verse 2, how long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked sila so ye, ye is plural there it's talking about the people of the earth and the judges of the earth that judge unjustly and one of the ways of judging unjustly is accepting persons where you change the judgment of what's right and what's wrong of, of who's going to win in a dispute based on just who the person is and this is how, you know, people with a bunch of power, influence, money, whatever, are able to buy verdicts for themselves. They're able to buy favor by greasing the wheels and, and you know, bribing the judges and, and getting away with murder. In many cases, getting away with murder, like literally. And it happens to this day, and everybody knows about it, and it's just one of those things that... Uh, God sees and it makes God angry and God is the ultimate judge and that we just need to remember when there are corrupt judges and when there are people, evil, wicked people in, in high places that do wicked things and are never being brought to justice that they will face their day one day. It is coming because God judgeth among the gods. God is their judge and, and he will do justice. And, and this also, this passage is showing us how a judge should properly judge because the unjust judge is going to accept the persons of the wicked. Like it says in verse number two, they're going to just show favor to someone regardless of just going off of what's true and what's right and what's just. They give preference to specific people. Verse number three, defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. So a good judge, again, will be able to defend the poor and the fatherless, the people who don't have the means to defend themselves. 
I mean, this is one of the reasons why that the country that we live in that was founded as a Christian nation even has the opportunity of having public defenders and things like that just to provide people who don't have any means with the ability to be able to defend themselves in a court of law and not just requiring them to be the mouthpiece for, for themselves if they don't have anyone else to advocate for them or speak for them. And that is what a righteous society should do. We ought, we ought to be looking out for the cares and the needs of the needy, of the poor, of the fathers, of those that don't have power, influence, or money in their life. Because, and why would we ever do that? Because we care about justice. We care about right and wrong. We care about the truth. And if you care about those things, we ought to seek that our judges, that our justice system would be set up in a way so that everybody will get a fair shake. Everyone will get a fair trial. Everyone will be able to have justice executed and at the end of the day, the way the Bible lays out is that the judges are really responsible for making sure that everything's done decently and in order and that justice will prevail through these judges. And, and a judge in the Bible, you know, it's, it's not necessarily just the way that we think of a judge as far as, you know, the guy wearing the black robe sitting behind the bench or whatever. Um, the judges are people that would oftentimes be the rulers of a kingdom as well. Now, of course, you have judges as well and people who would judge matters at the law, but judges also can be called people who were the rulers of the nation as well. We read through the whole book of Judges. Before there was a king, they had judges. And these were the people who were the leaders, the ones that, that kind of ruled over, not with, with the authority of a king, but they, they were the ones that were leading the way and, uh, and, and guiding the people and protecting the people and stuff like that, and the people that people would look to for judgment for, um, and for discernment. Look at verse number four. The Bible says, deliver the poor and needy, rid them out of the hand of the wicked. These are all things that a good judge would do. Verse five, they know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. So, Verse 2 started off with how long will you judge unjustly? It explains good just, you know, a good judge versus a bad judge. And then goes back to they know not, they don't understand, they walk on in darkness. Why? Because they're not seeking the Lord, because they're their own gods, because they're judging just according out of their own heart or whatever and their own interest instead of seeking the Lord to be the judge and looking to the law of God to be the truth and to be uh, the deciding factor on how we ought to be judging. Verse 6 says, I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. But ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. And I'll get to that point about you're all children of the Most High in, in, a, little, in a little bit. I'm just going to skip over that for right now. And he says, and ju just to put that phrase out for just a second, because we're like I said, I'll come back to that. He says, I have said, ye are gods, but ye shall die like men. He's saying, you, you know, yeah, I called you gods because you guys, essentially, it's because they think they're gods. They think they're so powerful and they're so mighty and they, they've got all this influence and power. He says, but you're going to die like men, right? Because you can't just go and, like, kill God, right? Like, God is, is if God's all powerful, like, what, what do you think you're doing, right? You can't do anything, but you're just going to die like a man. You think you're gods, you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. And there's that reference again to judging in that last verse. Now, the gods uh, here reference in this passage are their rulers, their judges, and whether they're men who claim to be gods or idols representing some false god, those are the gods that we're seeing in the Bible. And um, let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 28. I want to show you an example in scripture of a ruler who is acting like or thinking like he's a god. And actually, I'm going to turn there too because there's, there's actually, Ezekiel 28 is real interesting. There's two references here. And uh, without spending too much time going through this passage, and you could read it later, there is um, what I believe is going on in this passage is that you have the ruler who's referenced at the beginning, the prince of Tyrus. 
who would be the king of Tyrus at that time, okay? But then you also have Satan referenced as well as being uh, someone who's ruling there. And, and I believe both are referenced here. You've got the prince of Tyrus and you've got the king of Tyrus because they're both uh, these powers in authority there. One of them is the physical human being ruler and the other one is Satan himself. Uh, let's start reading in verse number one. The Bible says, the word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas. Right? And, and remember, Tyrus was a, a, a coastal city. It was one that, that got a lot of wealth and traffic from, from the ships. And, and it was a powerful city at one time. And he's saying to the prince, and prince oftentimes is used as a king, as well as someone who is going to be king, right? Like someone, the first one, prince, because comes from the word principal, the first, right? That is going to be in charge there. And uh, he says that you've, you, your heart is lifted up. You said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God. Like that, that's, that's where this guy's heart is at. He's thinking just like, I'm God. And look at, look at the next phrase, yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. Just like Psalm 82 was saying, you know, I've said you're gods, but you shall die like men. You think you're a God, you think you're so powerful, but you're going to die like a man. You're going you're to find out that you are truly no God. No matter what crazy thought you've got going on in your mind, it's going to, you know, you're going to find out real quick that you're just a man. And, and uh, you know, just pausing real quick right here. This is one of the dangers of pride. And this is, you, you really, you really need to get yourself in check when it comes to pride. And if you ever start noticing proud tendencies in your life. And normally, I think, especially for believers, and, and most of us here are, pride, I mean, I don't know everybody's financial situation, but I think we're mostly humble, like, mostly humble people. Right, like no one in our church, I think, is like really just extravagantly rich or anything like that. Not that there would be anything wrong with a rich person being part of a church, but I just, I just don't think we have that here. But the reason why I even bring that up is because it's easier to start becoming full of pride when you're being blessed. Now, it could be financially, that's one of the easiest ways. Like you just start coming across all this money and if you really just start coming across a lot of money, it's easier to start thinking high, higher of yourself, like, like you start to think you deserve this. You know what I mean? As opposed to being real humble and just be like, look, Lord, I don't deserve all this stuff. Thank you for giving this to me and just being real humble about it, right? God blessed me. Yeah, I work it hard, but you know what? God's blessing me with this stuff and keeping a humble mindset. But the more you're increased, the easier it is to start letting that go to your head. And then on top of that, maybe you've got a bunch of people telling you how great you are and people all looking up to you and you've got this status and you start, you know, like you start to have more influence. This is when it, it really can start getting to your head into thinking that you're just greater than other people. And when you start thinking that like I'm just so special and I'm so much better than other people, that's, you know, this is where the pride kicks in. And, it, and it, be, it becomes blinding. Now, again, people from humble backgrounds and, and where we're at, it's rare you run across someone who's just really full of pride in those scenarios. You, you, it's, just, it's just hard to be like that because when you don't really have a whole lot, you, you, even if you kind of think you're, 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 you know, you're, you're something that's super special, you just kind of look around and, and be reminded like, well, no, I'm still just more like everybody else, right? It's, it's the people who get elevated in status that can really start letting this go to their head. But the, the real danger is, is when you just allow yourself to, get, to give into that lust of the flesh of, of having that self-love and self-exaltation that goes along with being proud and being just so full of pride that you can start to blind yourself and it gets to the point 
with, with some people where they're just like, they just, they get so full of themselves, they just think they're God. And there was a story once, and, and I remember reading this story, and I, I think it got dumped down the memory hole somewhere. Does anyone remember the story of Mark Zuckerberg acting real crazy, like I think he was like running down the street naked or something, or almost naked, like just like out of, like people were saying like they thought he might have been on drugs or something else and just kind of, does anyone remember hearing that story in the news at all ever? I mean, this was years ago. Okay, I've got a couple people, a few people are saying, yeah, I remember reading that. Like I, you don't see anything about that anywhere uh, yeah, they try to hide that. Well, and especially someone who's who's part of the social media giant, right? Like they're real good at hiding what they don't want you to see. And I remember when I saw that because it wasn't that long after Facebook was just like blew up, and and he you know came across so much money uh, from from Facebook just being so popular, just su such as this social media giant, right? And uh, and, and kind of amassing all this wealth and power, and, and it really is powerful to sway the opinions of people, and I'm not gonna get into all the details on that through social media and stuff like that, where it, it, you know, one person having so much given to them, and, and such a dramatic change, too, to go from like, I mean, I, I don't know, I don't know Mark Zuckerberg's background or anything like that, or his history, but just as, a, you know, if he was just like a college kid or whatever, but then going into just having wealth untold, like just being able to do anything you want ever, whenever you want, just having people serving you all the time and just all this stuff, like that can get to your head. And this is the type of wealth that the really rich and really wealthy people have and the rulers of the world at different times just think like, like we're gods. And it blinds you into, because right now we can think, I'd be like, who would think they're God? Like, you know, you're not a God. But when you give yourself over to that pride, you, you just del you're delusional. You get so wrapped up in that self-love, you, you, you literally start to think like, I'm a God. And, th and this is what the Bible's talking about here with these people who are in power. And I think, I believe also, and this is just my personal belief, I believe that this is also why Satan continues to fight. And, and even as we read through Revelation, how he's going to still try to gather people together even after he's been bound for a thousand years and still tries to get people together. Like, like if you ever thought you could ever win or beat God somehow, I believe that he gets that way because the Bible says that he was lifted up with pride and that that was one of the major sins of Satan at all was that you know he was built beautiful, he was this, this anointed cherub and, and how great he was. And then sin was found in him, and he thinks that he, you know, he's the one who wants to be God, and he's the one who's, you know, when, when the Antichrist comes, that's the beast. They're going to be worshiping the beast in his image. You have to receive the mark of his name in your hand or in your forehead, and, and all of this stuff around the worship of him. Why? Because he wants to be God. He's so full of himself and so full of pride and thinks he's so great and wants people to worship him that I believe he's just self-deluded into thinking that he still might have a chance at, like, somehow overthrowing God or usurping God's authority and becoming God himself. Because when people get so lifted up in that pride, you just literally just become blind to reality. This is why I think, even with, the, with everything prophesied and just foretold, like, no, this is the way it's going to go down, that Satan still is just going to go along and do this. We know he's going to do this stuff, and I think the reason why, from Satan's perspective, <laughs> would be because he's just so wrapped up in himself and full of pride. Now, I could be wrong about that. You know, angels and, and human beings aren't exactly the same. But to me, it makes sense because w you can see when people get that crazy level of thinking they're so, you know, when they get so blinded with that pride, that that's what pride does to a person. This is why we need to just always keep ourselves in check and just don't let yourself start even going down that path of being proud. Verse 3 there in Ezekiel 28, Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. With thy wisdom and with thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic hast thou increased thy riches, and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. 
So he's saying, look, you've got all this great wisdom and you've been able to traffic and trade and, and do all these different things to increase your riches and you've just amassed so much wealth that now that has lifted up your heart to, now, to where you've gotten to this point where you think you're a god because of all of these riches that you've accumulated to yourself. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God, behold, therefore I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall defile thy brightness. They shall bring thee down to the pit, and thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. Wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? And I, I just love this. It's so powerful, right? Like, like I'm going to bring these other nations against you, and they're going to kill you, right? They're going to come, and they are going to cut your head off. And are you going to say, and I added that, right? It doesn't say that literally, but they're gonna, it says they're going to kill him, okay? And he's like, are you going to, like right before they kill you, you're going to be like, but I'm God. Like, what are you going to, you're not going to be able to stop him. Like, I am going to have you killed, right? The true God is going to bring these people in and kill you. But thou shalt be a man and know God in the hand of him that slayeth thee. Yeah, the guy that comes and kills you, you're not a god to him. You're going to fall like a man. Thou shalt die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord. Now, verses 1 through 10, I do believe that this is talking about the, the human being, the, king, the, the prince that's in charge here of running this place, because he's talking about him being killed with uh, you know, by the hand of these other nations that are going to come in and, and destroy him, right? And that he, his heart is lifted up. But if we keep reading here, verse number 11 says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. Now remember, verse 1 or 2 was talking about the prince of Tyrus, and now he's talking about the king of Tyrus. And say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Verse 13 says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Now, now all of a sudden it's like, whoa, what are you talking about? You've been in Eden? This physical human being that was the ruler of Tyrus was not in Eden. In the garden of God. Just to clear it up, he's not talking about just some place called Eden. Like, oh yeah, I've been to Eden. Or I've been to nowhere. There's a place called Nowhere, Arizona. Like, I've been, I've been to nowhere, right? You have another city called Eden somewhere. It's like, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the garden of God. Like, we all know the Eden that is that has the garden of God where God made Adam and, and Adam and Eve dwelt. That's the Eden he's talking about. Every precious stone was thy covering. And then he, he lists off how, how great you know, all these stones, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the, the holy mountain of God, Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. And, and so here, remember, the king had amassed riches to himself. The prince, when it said in the, in the first few pages, he amassed riches to himself. He was really good at trading and was really good at gathering wealth. And that's why he was lifted up in pride. But Satan, here, the anointed cherub that was in the Garden of Eden, why was he lifted up? Because of his beauty. Because God made him so beautiful. And look, you could be sitting here today going, I don't have any money. How I'm not going to get lifted up with pride. Well, how wrapped up are you in your looks? And the funny thing about beauty is that some people can get lifted up in beauty that many other people might not consider to be that beautiful, but they, they think themselves are just that beautiful, right? Because it, it, it's, it's subjective, right? It's something that you can just look at yourself and think, oh, I am just so beautiful and whatever. I mean, now, not everyone can do that. Like, I, know, I, I don't have a, a chance at getting wrapped up that way, but people... Uh, you know, it, it's, it's another area where someone can look at themselves and just stare at themselves in the mirror and think how great they are because, oh, I'm so beautiful and this and that. 
And this is how Satan was. He thought, you know, he, he, and he was created beautifully. God created him beautifully. He was able to sing. He was able to, you know, he just looked uh, really beautiful. And that allowed his heart to get lifted up. Thy heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. And on and on. And it just talks about him taking, you know, Satan down. So we see the two references there. One being to the king, the other being to Satan, who was also like the real one, I guess, in charge there, uh, spiritually speaking, of that city. So these are the gods and this, these are the people who are calling themselves. This is in line with what we're seeing in Psalm 82, right? Does that make sense? And Satan's lie, even from the very beginning, and turn if you would to, um, turn if you would to Hosea chapter 14. Hosea chapter 14. Even going back to Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, the, the, the Satan's lie to Eve, uh, the Bible says, And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So he was going back to trying to get people to want to be like God, saying that you'll be gods. Right, because you'll you'll have all this knowledge. So you, you know, God has all this knowledge, so you'll be gods because you're going to get that knowledge. And that was how he was tempting them, tempting uh, Eve specifically, to be like God. And Satan still uses that tactic, tempting people to to want to be like God, and to offer them something to have a godlike status. And that is, that is the heart of pride, covetousness, everything that the Bible talks about as being wicked are the things that Satan exalts and the things that Luciferians would say are good things. But, but we know that they're, they're not, and they destroy a person. You let, give yourself over to these things and to thinking you're so great, it destroys you. Now, there's one other passage I'm going to read for you from Exodus 22 that I believe is, I'm bringing it up, it's just one verse, because I think it's relevant to Psalm 82, again, given the context of Psalm 82. Because just, just to kind of back up for a second and clear things up, while the vast majority of time in Scripture, gods are talking about idols, false gods that people worship, that people think are gods, right? Just in general, vast 90 some percent of the time you're going to see references to gods as people worshiping false gods okay psalm 82 is a little bit different because it's referring to to people who are considering themselves like god right these are the people who are in charge these rulers and there are much fewer references to this application of someone being like a god or wanting to be god we see the temptation in genesis of being like gods we see the example in Ezekiel of a king just thinking that he is God because he's in this position of power and wealth and everything else. We have Exodus 22, verse 28, which says, Thou shalt not revile the gods, nor curse the ruler of thy people. And here, I believe that reviling the gods is talking about the rulers. So when it puts it, it, it uh, right next to, nor, nor curse the ruler of thy people, not reviling the gods, nor the ruler of thy people, is talking about those that are in those positions of, of, of having that power and, you know, kind of being like they think they're gods, right? Because this isn't talking, I, I don't think this is talking about the idols, the actual idols, not reviling the idols or the idolatry. Uh, this is specifically being conjoined with the ruler of thy people. So uh, that's another example that we can see here showing some more support that would be similar to context of Psalm 82. And then we have Hosea 14. Now, um, Hosea 14, we're going to see that God is a helper of the needy. And all the good attributes we saw in Psalm 82 of how a, a judge should be, we see this being attributed to the Lord. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Take with you words and turn to the Lord. Say unto him, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously. 
so will we render the calves of our lips. Asher shall not save us. We will not ride upon horses. Neither will we say any more to the work of our hands, ye are our gods. For in thee the fatherless findeth mercy. So this is a repentant people who are going to the Lord and seeking his graciousness and seeking his mercy and expressing, you know, when say Asher shall not save us, they're not trusting in flesh. They're not trusting in any nation or any powerful people to help them. They're going to put their trust in the Lord. Asher shall not save us. We're not going to ride upon horses. We're not going to trust in our military might, we're not going to think that any weapons that we have are really going to save us and that that is what we're trusting in for our safety. No, we're looking to the Lord. He says, neither will we say any more to the work of our hands, ye are our gods, right? The recognizing, the idolatry and stuff. Look, that's just, these are just things that we made. They're not really gods. And, he, and then he says, for in thee the fatherless find mercy. So the, the attribute of the true God is that the fatherless get mercy from God. The, 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 the wood and the stone and the idols, they don't do that. They can't do anything. They're dumb. They're dumb idols. Now, with all of this groundwork being laid, let's go to John chapter 10. I think Psalm 82 as a whole, those eight verses, pretty simple to get the, the understanding of what it's talking about there. It's, it's the whole psalm is just referring to God being a righteous judge as compared to men who think they're gods, right? Pretty, pretty straightforward. but where people might get confused more frequently isn't with Psalm 82 as much as it is with John 10. Let's look at John 10, and we're going to get John 10 in context because this it really does matter when Jesus references this that we understand why he's even bringing it up to begin with. So look up there at verse number 23 in John chapter 10. We're going to start reading there. The Bible says, And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch, then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. So these Jews just, just are like, they're kind of harassing Jesus and just saying, How long? Like, just, just tell us plainly if you're the Christ. He's like, I have, and you don't believe me. Like, the works are bearing witness. Like, just look at what I'm doing. Look at the healing. Listen to what I'm saying. You just can't hear it. You refuse to hear it, right? This is, this is what's going on between Jesus and these Jews. They're not really interested in it. They're just trying to catch him in his words to have him arrested or to have him killed or to have him say something that they can use to accuse him of to get rid of him. They've already decided they know they don't think he's good. They don't think he's of God. But they, they come to him as people who are saying, oh, well, just, just tell us plainly. Verse, uh, verse 26 says, but ye believe not because ye are not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Amen. My Father, which gave them he, me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Now look at this. Because again, I mean, isn't he just saying he's the Christ here? <laughs> also, like, I mean, he's still just answering their question. Verse 31. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Again, because they already tried doing this before. Verse 32, Jesus answered them, How many good works have I showed you from my Father? For which of those works do you stone me? So now he's, he's talking to them, just going like, 
you've seen all the good I've been doing, so why are you, why are you about to stone me? What, what good work did I do? What work did I do that is going to make you want to stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Now, these people are out to stone him. They're trying to catch him in his words. They're trying, you know, just by asking him the question that they already don't want to know the answer to and don't want to hear. They're trying to find a way to kill him. Now, look, in John chapter 10, Jesus' hour has not yet come either. And this is no different than with the woman taken in adultery, right? Where they're like, well, Moses said that she should be stoned, but what sayest thou? Right? So they're trying to trap him, and they're trying to catch him into saying, in that situation, that if he says, well, yeah, she should be put to death, that they could get him in trouble with the Romans because they weren't allowed to deliver a death penalty sentence against anyone. They didn't have that authority to do that. And then if he said, if he said not to put her to death, well, they're going to say, well, Moses clearly says that she should be put, you know, so there's this contradiction, and they're trying to trap him. And, of course, he answered them wisely by saying, hey, he that's without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. So he still proclaims the death penalty in such a way that no one can, you know, he can't get in trouble with the Romans, and he's not going to, you know, and, and it convicts them and everything else, right? So there's, he's just super wise in his answers. And you know what we see here? Another use of wisdom from Jesus to people who don't believe on him. They're not going to believe on him. They don't want to believe in him. Their heart is already rejected him. Okay. So he says, you know, many good works. Why do you stone me? And then they answered saying for good work, we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou being a man, makest thyself God. Jesus answered them, verse 34, is it not written in your law? I said, ye are gods. Now, Notice this, too, because you'll see this on a couple of occasions, two or three occasions at least in the Scripture, that, like, all of the Old Testament can be referred to as the law. And this is clear from this passage right here, because Jesus says, is it not written in your law? I said ye are God. Now, in the first five books, which are called the books of Moses, you will not find the, the, this, this quote, I said ye are God's doesn't exist it does exist in psalms and psalm 82 specifically okay that's where you find it but he's saying is it not written in your law so he's including the psalms as part of the law and and the prophets are also considered as part of the law it's it's just this this big uh uh encompassing the law, right, as being all of the Old Testament. The law and the prophets sometimes are separated, but don't, don't let it bother you that he's saying it's written in law. It's not a mistake. It's just a, it's just a grouping of all of the Old Testament scriptures as being the law. Verse 35, but now, and now he's going to, he, he just, he brings them this passage because they should know this. They're, they're these Pharisees and stuff. They know what the psalm says. I said, ye are gods. They know, yeah, it's Psalm 82. Now, they didn't have the numbers on then, but verse 35, if he called them gods unto whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, which, by the way, that's another important fact right there. Scripture cannot be broken, meaning God's word doesn't have contradictions. So when scripture can't be broken, it can't, God does, the Bible can't just say something and be, and be the word of God, but it's not really true. Or it's not, you know, it's not going to come to pass or something, you know, something to that effect. Or there's just some inherent con contradiction. No, it can't be broken. So he gives them, he, he posits the question to them. Hey, if he called them gods unto whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the father hath sanctified and sent in the world, thou blasphemest because I said I am the son of God. So. His claim to be the son of God is what he's throwing back at them, saying, you're calling me a blasphemer? The scripture said to these other people to whom the word of God came, I said, you're gods. But you want to stone me because I said I'm the son of God? Do you see what he's, do what he's doing there? He's using scripture against them. 
because they don't understand the scripture anyways because they're not saved. They don't hear the voice. They, they don't get it. So it's easy for him to just throw this passage out there because they won't have an answer at all to that. Because they might not even understand why he said, I said, you're God, right? So he's just saying, he's like, Jesus is throwing this out there to him, going, okay, well, scripture can't be broken there. He called them gods. Well, what about me? I just said, I'm the son of God. If I do not the works of my father, believe me not. But if I do, though you believe not me, believe the works that ye may know and believe that the father is in me and I in him. Now look, that question that he throws back at them is Jesus being wise so that they don't try to stone him. He's diffusing the situation with that. I don't think that he's intentionally trying to make some extra type of teaching out of this other than just to say, like, look, this is what the scripture says there. I'm making this claim. You know, what's the, what's the problem here? Now, we know in the context of Psalm 82 it is it, what it's talking about and who these gods is. Well, I've said ye are gods. It's talking about these rulers. Now you can say, well, what about where it says, and all of you are children of the Most High? I told you I was going to get back to that from Psalm 82, verse 6. Because this is the literal quote, I have said, ye are gods. And all of you are children of the Most High. Someone getting so full of pride and thinking they're like a god still doesn't make that person a reprobate. Okay? It's not inherent that you just must be. I mean, people could be saved and get full of pride and full of themselves and lift it up. It happens. And people do foolish things. I mean, you know, there's plenty of people that I believe can get to that point of, of allowing the pride to, to get the better of them. And it may not specifically say it and, and it, and it may not be even necessarily, I'm thinking of examples in my mind right now in scripture. It might not be so extreme to where the person thinks they're God, but I would say like King Solomon is a good example of someone who probably got lifted up in pride through all of his wealth and, and his wisdom. Like he had this knowledge of wisdom, but he ended up doing these things almost as if like, like he knew it, but he did it anyways. He knew he shouldn't be marrying all these outlandish women and heathen women, but he did it anyways. He had the wisdom to know better, but he did it anyways. And, and it's kind of like, well, where did this even come from? And I, I did a real interesting Bible study back in, I think it was in 1 Kings, where right after it mentions the amount of gold that Solomon was getting in, and it mentions it was you know 666 talents of gold in that year, is that's when you start reading of like the downfall of Solomon and him doing the, it's, it's, it's really interesting in the scripture, the way the whole story is written. You can look that up later uh, if, you don't, if you don't remember that. But um, I think that shows, you know, with all of those riches amassed and with all the ease that he had, there was no wars, there was no troubles, it was a time of peace, everyone was looking up to him, that he, he, in, he overindulged. And that's for a fact that he overindulged. I mean, look at how many wives and concubines he had. That, that alone tells you, yeah, he overindulged. Okay, and, and he allowed himself, even Ecclesiastes, he, he's given himself to wine. He's, you know, he's like, yeah, but I kept my wisdom. But he's saying how he's, he's tried all these other things and he's kind of trying everything that the world has to offer, which if you have the wisdom, you don't have to try those things. You don't have to prove it. Right? He did it. He was, and he's saying that he did it. Right? It's not that he was right to do things that way. You don't, you, you don't have to try getting drunk to know that it's bad for you and to know that the effects are going to be bad for you. you. You don't have to go down that bed and be like, well, I just wanted to check it out for myself. No, one, if you have the wisdom, just get the wisdom from the word of God. You don't have to do that. But we see that Solomon did do a lot of those things that he shouldn't have done. And, and, you know, part of it, I think, had to do with being lifted up with pride. Now, do I think he got to the point where he thought he was God? No, I don't think he got that far. But he did get to the point to where he's even like, building these altars to false gods for his wives that turned his heart away from the Lord. And I mean, 
you're losing a lot of fear of the Lord if you're willing to do something like that. And if you're losing a fear of the Lord, you're probably thinking a lot higher of yourself. I mean, they all kind of go hand in hand. You see what I'm saying here? Now, back to what I was talking about, though, about being where he said, and all of you are children of the Most High. So this, the people he's talking about here is saying, hey, I've said you're gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. They could be saved people, because here's the thing. All we see about people being a child of God, or in this case, a child of the Most High, are people who are born again. And you're going to have a hard time finding someone being referred to as a child of God that is not a believer in Scripture. And I'm, I don't have time to get into, well, what about the angels being the sons of God in Job or whatever? The Bible never says that. And in fact, over and over again, you know, we've got Hebrews. But unto which of the angels said he at any time, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Okay. Implying that God has never said to any angel, you're my son. So you would think that if they are sons of God and they can communicate with God, that at some point he would have said, you're my son, to an angel. But the scripture says he's never said that. So, so that's kind of solid evidence about angels not being the sons of God. Because the, the Hebrews 1 also says that they're ministering spirits, right, sent to minister. We also see in John chapter 1, it says, but to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So how do you become a son of God? By believing, by putting your faith in Christ. So uh, that, that's kind of a little bit more of an exhaustive study on its own of checking out all the time where the Bible's referring to people as being sons of God or children of God or children of the Most High. But it's talking about people who are saved. And one other place I want you to turn to is Genesis chapter 6. Because this is also a place where I think that you have people who are saved, they're children of God, but here's the thing, a child of God can get a lot of wisdom, and they could have a good, maybe a good upbringing and everything else, but then just go the way of the world, and they can still have a good strong ethic, a work ethic, things like that, and become very successful in this world, and be lifted up, and be able to you know, accomplish all of these things and have a lot of human accomplishments and still be saved, but just totally living for the world and, and, and doing that and living their life that way. Now, obviously, God will chastise people, but it never, you know, it's never a guarantee that someone who's amassed riches, that if they just continue to give themselves over riches, is going to lose their riches, right? They could still be in those positions of power. Now, I, I don't think that they'll be happy right we know that they won't be so if you're you know if, you're, if you become covetous and going after money and you're greedy and you're attaining to these positions of power and you have that desire and you're giving yourself over to that fleshly desire as a child of god it will pierce you with sorrow sorrows like first timothy chapter six says and you know it's gonna drown men in destruction and perdition but it's totally possible for saved people to give themselves over to covetousness which is why 1 Corinthians chapter 5 says that to put away that wicked person from among you, if someone is covetous, that's called a brother. Right? So, of course, you can get to that point, and I think even to where people, if you get really just full of bl just blindness and get to the point where you're, you're like at this, this ruler stage, you're thinking you're like a god. I mean, Eve wanted to be like a god. That's why she took of the fruit. Because Satan said, hey, you're going to be like gods, knowing good and evil. It's like, oh, that doesn't sound so bad. Genesis chapter 6, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. And look, this is after the flood. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. 
And, you know, this is another passage where people want to say, oh, the giants, they're Nephilim, right? It, and let me, I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to park on this just for a few minutes and then we're done. I told you it doesn't matter how short the passage is. <laughs> if you hear people talk about the Nephilim, it's the Hebrew word for giant. It, there's nothing different about that word other than it's a different language. But it's a giant, okay, first of all. And people like using that because it makes it sound cool. It makes it sound different. No, 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 I'm not just talking about giants. I'm talking about the Nephilim. Giants. Yeah, in English, it's giants, okay? So not the New York giants, giants. And that's, it, it, that's where it says verse 3, and the, and the Lord said unto, and said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continued. So there's a, a weird false doctrine out there that says that angels came down to this earth, when the Bible says the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that those are angels and that they procreated with human women and they produced giants. I don't see how you can read and comprehend English and walk away with that understanding of this passage if someone didn't tell you that that's what happened here. If you do a Bible study on the sons of God, you're going to find out that sons of God are believers. Okay? Number two, if the sons of God referenced here is talking about angels, then why in verse three does the Lord say, my spirit should not always strive with man. Not my spirit should not always strive with angels. Man. And then, why would it, re when it references the sons of God taking wives, which the Bible says that they're not as the angels in heaven who neither marry or are given in marriage. The angels don't marry, they're not given in marriage, okay? But they took wives, and it says, these sons of God took wives of the daughters of men. God gets angry, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Verse 4 then says, there were giants in the earth in those days. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men. So when did the sons of God come in unto the daughters of men? After there were giants. He says, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also, after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same, the same what? The same children that were born of the sons of God and the daughters of men became mighty men, not half-breeds, not hybrids, Men which were of old, men of renown. What, what you see going on here, and then of course verse 5, and God saw that the wickedness of man, not the wickedness of angels, not the wickedness of devils, man was great in the earth. And that the, every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Okay. That kind of dispels that false doctrine. But what, what will we actually see, what, the, what we actually see happening here though, is you've got some saved guys looking at unsaved women, just the daughters of men, right? Sons of God, righteous people, but they're setting their eyes on the wrong women, okay? And their whim, the women, these, the, the heathen women, are turning their hearts away from serving the Lord. But there's still these Christian guys, and they end up raising these children to just be these really great, mighty 
people in the earth that are gonna, you know, they're 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 very productive. They're very industrious. They're very, you know, they're they're because they're they're a really good citizen in society and and doing a lot of great things, right? And they're men of renown, meaning they're they're becoming famous and known in the world. That's what's happening here. And I think that's the same thing that's, that's being talked about with these people who are living for the world that, hey, they're children of the Most High, but they've, they've, they've let themselves just, just, just come to live for the world. Yeah, they could be renowned, they could be famous and stuff, but it's like you're wasting your whole life. And then you have wickedness that goes along with that. And the wickedness of man was great. So they're doing a bunch of wicked things. It doesn't mean they were unsaved, but they just, when you give yourselves over to live like the world, a whole bunch of wickedness follows. And you may be lifted up with pride and, and getting these people who are able to accomplish a lot in this world. They've got focus, they've got drive, they're, you know, they're, they're raising their children in a stable household or whatever, but they're, they're just not work, you know, they're not focused on serving the Lord at all. They're just serving their own belly. So, you know, we kind of looked at a bunch of different passages tonight. I hope that makes sense. Um, and, and these are probably the primary passages when the Bible is talking about the gods there and saying, ye are gods, that are not referring to the common usage of gods just being an idol or a false god like an Allah or Buddha or the Hindu god or whatever that people are worshiping that are false gods. Right? These are in reference to men. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for this passage. We thank you for uh, all the great truths that you give us. I pray that you would please help us remain humble no matter how much you bless us and, uh, and, and, and that we would keep our, our thoughts and our minds on you and that we would raise our children to live good, godly lives and not to get wrapped up in the cares and the riches of this world. Dear Lord, um, we thank you so much for your mercy and and. Just pray that you please keep us all safe as we go our separate ways this evening. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.